so I was out of contact with my battalions all night. It was good that they had not yet entered the battle. Meanwhile, General Krugliakov tried to negotiate with the commanders of the first echelon divisions. But frequent gusts of the report lines, and in addition poor hearing, did not allow him to establish regular contact with them. Later, he began to conduct all negotiations through the chief of staff of the corps, who duplicated them to the commanders. By morning, a direct telephone connection with the corps switchboard was finally established, and the chief of staff sent two additional radios. It became easier. With dawn, our troops were ready to continue the offensive. Artillery preparation began at nine Sua. It lasted 15 minutes and was conducted with much less density of fire than yesterday. And still regiments and divisions went forward. They advanced another four to six kilometres. And here we met quite strong resistance of the enemy, who on the flanks even went into counter-attack. On the right of the suspended, our units hit up to a regiment of his infantry and six tanks. On the left, up to two regiments of infantry and 15 tanks. Counter-attackers soon crushed both flanks of the corps and by 14, Vazis again occupied the crest of the unnamed heights and the village of Kandogi. In this situation, the corps commander ordered me to help one battalion of the right flank regiment to hold the second trench, and by evening to occupy the line from where this regiment began today's offensive, with another battalion to take away from Hitlerites the village of Kandogi. Leave the third battalion in place. He will receive orders from me personally, said Comcor. Yes, a task. To fulfil it on the front of 12 kilometres to the regiment is not so easy. But an order is an order. I began to analyse the situation. On the right flank of the corps, the fate of our offensive is certainly not decided. But Kandogi is closer to the centre of our battle order. And if the enemy will introduce here fresh forces, which are already pulling up, it will be able to come to the rear of our two divisions, that is, the main forces of the corps. And this is already fraught with severe consequences. Reporting my thoughts to the corps commander asked him for permission to send to the right flank with a battalion of his deputy. With the other, I myself will go to repel the village. My decision General Krugliakov approved. From the crest of the heights and from the side of the village of Kandogi, the enemy had a pretty good view of the area we occupied. And it was risky to move battalions along the front in front of his eyes. It would take a long time to get through the trenches and communication lines of the former German defences. And to lose time is to lose the battle. So solve, Commander, a problem with three unknowns. And yet he decided, the battalion, moving to the right flank, to withdraw first back to the neutral zone and then already along the ravine, reaching the Dnieper, to reach the right flank regiment we needed. That's what I did. But the 3rd Battalion, which was to take the village of Kandogi, still had to move to the initial position along the lines of communication. As a result, no matter how much the commander hurried me, no matter how hard I tried to speed up the advance of the battalions, it was not possible to do it before daylight. They took the initial position for the attack only late in the evening, the 3rd Battalion was now commanded by Captain K.K. Sergabayev, a Kazakh by nationality, a young and rather energetic man. He had arrived in the regiment in October and remembered me by the originality of his report. I have the honour to introduce myself, Captain Sergabayev. I have arrived at your disposal. He turned out to be a strong-willed, knowledgeable commander. And yet I was worried about him. After all... Now the battalion entrusted to him will have to knock the enemy out of the village to help our withdrawn units to restore the situation. The enemy, to all appearances, has considerable forces there. So, the knight should be our ally, though. It will ensure the suddenness of the attack. The enemy is probably not expecting an attack now, confident that he's facing only the day's battered units. Knight, moreover, will compensate for our lack of artillery, after all, except for the artillery and mortar batteries of the regiment, we have no more guns, and finally the darkness will hide our forces, which are certainly not more than the enemy. And we, acting boldly, assertively, making as much noise as possible at once, will create an illusion of our superiority. After all, as they say, fear has great eyes.
By 21 Dozeo, Sirgabayev's battalion took the initial position for the attack in the fighting order of the regiment that withdrew in the afternoon. His thinning units would also assist us. The enemy was entrenched along the eastern edge of the village. We can even see the silhouettes of his soldiers against the background of burning houses. From time to time, enemy machine guns were strobing, then in one, then in another place, single mines and shells were bursting. Captain Sirgabev reported to me about the readiness of the battalion to attack. And you? I asked the lightly wounded commander, who now commands the rest of the regiment instead of the commander killed in the day. Also ready, he answered. Give the command, Sirgabayev. In order not to alarm the Hitlerites before the time, we decide not to give any light signal, pass the order by voice along the chain and attack without shouting, Hurrah! A soft command was heard. Rifles and machine guns rang. The soldiers rose from the trench in shadows and disappeared into the night. Well, now it will begin. The fascists realised only when the Red Army's machine gun bursts hit them almost at point-blank range. The bursts of hand grenades rang out in unison. In response, enemy machine guns rumbled and German artillery opened fire but its shells were bursting somewhere behind the chains. The first houses on the eastern edge of the village are already ours. Prisoners appeared. Forward, only forward. Hitlerites try to organise resistance in the centre of Handog, where there are a church and a stone school. But there was no way. Our fighters can't be stopped. By the way, in the school, as it turned out, was the headquarters of the enemy infantry regiment, one of those that counter-attacked us this afternoon. Few Nazi officers managed to stay alive, only those who surrendered as prisoners. The battle in the village continued until dawn. It was our fighters killed Hitlerites, who were in attics, cellars and cellars. So, by morning, Sirgabayev's battalion knocked out the enemy from Handog and took then the defence in one and a half kilometres to the west of the village. But the commander himself... When the battalion came to the opposite outskirts of Kandog, was, unfortunately, seriously wounded by a machine gun burst from the attic of one of the houses. He was immediately evacuated to the rear. Lieutenant Zarudin took command of the battalion. By the way, Lieutenant Y.F. Zarudin, commanding the 8th Company, in this night battle showed not only personal bravery and courage, but also enviable disposition, ability to act boldly, decisively. His company was the first to break into the village. Advancing in the centre of the battalion's combat order, it blocked the church and school, where, as already mentioned, was the headquarters of the German regiment. The company killed about 100 enemy soldiers and officers, took 40 prisoners, among whom were three junior officers and even one major, the commander of the German infantry battalion. Looking ahead, I will say that Y.F. Zarudin to this day continues to serve in the army. He is a colonel general, hero of the Soviet Union. Yes, the 3rd Battalion fulfilled its task, but neither I nor the chief of staff of the regiment have any data about the 1st. We could not establish communication with it by radio and telephone communication at such a distance, even more so. True. The Chief of Staff sent a man to this battalion at 24 Earl, then, already at 4 Earl, a second one. But neither returned. Did they die? The Corps Commander, when I reported to him that the village of Kapdogi had been taken and the 3rd Battalion had secured itself west of it, asked me what the 1st Battalion was doing. I had to report the whole truth. There was no communication with it. It was possible to establish it only by about 10 o'clock in the morning. From the report sent by the deputy commander of the regiment, Major A. I. Korovin, I learned that the 1st Battalion, together with the units of the regiment, which he was sent to help, in the night battle also pushed back the Nazis for a kilometre and a half and consolidated on the achieved line. Then Korovin asked what the battalion should do next. I reported about it to the commander, General Krugliakov listened to me and asked, Did you not inform Korovin that since morning the battalion should continue the offensive? No, Comrade General. Nobody gave me such a task either. And then how will the battalion attack on its own without a regiment? 
it would be better to leave it where it is. Let it stay in your reserve on the right flank. There's no telling what else the fascists might do. General Krugliakov, having thought about it, agreed with me. Meanwhile, the divisions of the Corps, having regrouped their forces overnight, in the morning resumed the offensive. But the Nazis, during the night, managed to regroup, with a fresh infantry regiment, as well as withdrawn from the unnamed heights near the village of Kandogi units, they took a new line, strengthened it well, created a fairly dense system of fire in front of their front line. And our short and, in addition, rather weak artillery preparation before the beginning of the offensive did not give much. In particular, almost no enemy firepower was suppressed. This led to the fact that only a few of our units managed to break into the first enemy trench. They tried to reach the second trench, but fell under heavy artillery and machine gun fire and lay down. Slow gnawing of the enemy's defence began. And yet, somewhere around noon, all three commanders reported to the corps commander that their units captured the second trench, but suffered heavy losses. The battle for the third trench continued with varying success until the evening. Only the 290th and left flanking divisions advancing in the centre finally captured it, and right flanking so remained in the second. The dawn of the fourth day of the fiercest fighting came, and in these hours Hitlerites preempted us, having started intensive artillery preparation. Explosions of shells and mines densely covered the whole combat order of the corps, but especially powerful cannonade was heard in the field of action of the 290th Infantry Division. Artillery preparation lasted not long, a little more than 20 minutes, after which the Nazis went on the attack, dealing the main blow to the centre of the core combat order. Dawn had just begun, so it was difficult to make out what was being done there, ahead. We could only hear heavy machine gun and machine gun fire, grenade bursts. Then we heard the rumble of tank engines. Soon up to a battalion of enemy infantry appeared in front of us. True, without tanks, Hitlerites were approaching by shuffling, obviously accumulating in the ravine for attack bypassing the village of Kandogi. In a few minutes, it became clear. The enemy, having broken through the combat order of the units operating in front, came out in the flank of the 3rd Battalion of Lieutenant Zarudin, occupying the defence west of Kandog, and now trying to seize the village bypassing on the right. The centre of his battle order is aimed directly at my observation post, brought here last night. Ahead of the observation post, 200 metres away from it, is a company of machine gunners. There are three platoons of 18 men each. They are clearly not enough to repel the attack of almost a full German battalion. So, yes, we must let Lieutenant Zarudin know. Let him bend his right flank back a bit and hit the flank of this battalion, and the company of machine gunners will meet the fascists from the front. The radio operator quickly contacted Zarudin. Having explained to the commander the situation I had created, I told him, You see, in this case will be a kind of firebag between your right flank and the company of machine gunners. Do it. As soon as the fascists attack, fire from all kinds of fire, got it? Yes, look, from your front strike do not miss the blow. Combat 3 quickly reorganised his right flank, reinforcing it with two machine guns. A company of machine gunners also prepared for battle. At this minute I was called to the phone. Corps commander, said the telephonist, handing the receiver. What do you see? asked Comcor. I reported that I see up to a battalion of Hitlerites with three tanks on the heights in the strip of the 290th Infantry Division, and also in front of us, but without tanks. Part of our units are retreating. We must stop them, Krugliakov said excitedly. Do you hear me? Stop them. Raise the second battalion, immediately flashed a thought, and let him go in a chain to meet the retreating, stop and turn them back. Combater 2 to the phone, shouted to the telephonist. The commander of the 2nd Battalion, Captain G. V. Shliakovsky, arrived in the regiment from the hospital at the same time with Sergabayev. I liked him for his modesty and business-like performance. Shliakovsky, do you see those retreating in front of you? I see them, Comrade Major. 
Raise the battalion and chain up to meet them. Stop everyone and bring them back. Got it? Got it. We can be calm. Shliakovsky will do everything right. At this time, the enemy battalion had already drawn into the firebag prepared for it and rushed into the attack. But a strong fire from the front of the company of machine gunners, machine gun fire of the 3rd Battalion from the flank immediately put the attacking chain on the ground. Hitlerites, who had not expected it, panicked and started to roll back, suffering heavy losses. Shliakovsky's battalion, advancing forward meanwhile, returned the retreating units and the unnamed heights in front of him were already occupied by the enemy. We had to stop in one of the empty trenches in front of the heights to prepare to repel further attacks of the fascists. I reported to Comcor that the retreating units of the 2nd Battalion were stopped, and on the left by the forces of the 3rd Battalion and a company of machine gunners, one battalion of the enemy was defeated. Let the 2nd Battalion remain there, in front of the unnamed heights, Hold this trench at all costs, ordered General Krugliakov. Heavy fighting continued all day, and in the evening I was summoned by the corps commander and ordered to take the unnamed heights by morning and report to him from there. I asked who would replace my third battalion, to which I received the answer, it will remain in place. Then give me the first battalion to fulfil your task. No. The 1st Battalion will consolidate the line it's holding now. So we'll take the heights with only the 2nd Battalion, Comrade General? Yes, one battalion. And if you don't take... Krugliakov didn't finish. But I already understood what he wanted to say. So I answered, I'm not afraid of the court. But... The division surrendered the heights, and the battalion had to take them. There must be at least a regiment of fascists there. You'll have to figure out how to do it. You see what kind of situation we're in now. We can't get companies out of nowhere. And the heights, they're like an eyesore. So think, Homulo, think. I left Comcor's dugout with heavy thoughts. Although, is it necessary to be angry with Kruglyakov? For four days, the Corps can't break through the enemy's defence. The Germans are not only fierce resistance, but also continuously counter-attacked. Of course, it's not easy for Comcor. He too, of course, was hit by the commander more than once during this time. But what to do? We're really running out of strength. So, I remembered Krugliakov's final words. Think, Komulo. Think. Yes, we must think of something. All my deputies were already gathered at the regiment's observation post. I informed them about the upcoming task. After listening to me, they somehow slumped. After all, each of them realised that this task for the battalion alone is hardly feasible. But they also understood another thing. The order must be fulfilled. In the trench, we heard the stomping of feet and voices. Someone entered the dugout and said that they had brought the wounded commander of the 3rd Battalion, Zarudin. Let's bring him here, I shouted, and in my head I thought, who will command the battalion now? Zarudin was brought in on a trench coat. The bullet pierced his right shoulder and came out through his shoulder blade. Yes, the wound was serious. It put him out of action for a long time. Who will replace him? Zarudin? I came and leaned over the wounded man. Can you hear me? I can hear you, he replied in a weak voice. Which of the commanders are still in the battalion? Junior Lieutenant Zemnukov, whispered Zarudin. He is in command? Zarudin was urgently sent to the rear. Junior Lieutenant? No, the 3rd Battalion should be assigned another commander. But who? What if? Captain Guriev, the regiment's intelligence chief. After all, the 3rd Battalion is in a very important direction, holds a favourable line. It needs a strong-willed commander, someone like Guriev. Captain Guriev, I finally decide, go to the 3rd Battalion and take command of it. The task of the battalion is the same, not a step back. Stand to the death. Understood? Yes, Comrade Major. Understood. The commander of the 2nd Battalion, the commanders of the Company of Machine Gunners and Regimental Batteries, to me, 
I ordered now already the chief of staff. When they arrived, I gave them the task. The starting point for the attack, the trench in which the battalion is now. Start the attack at dawn when the Hitlerites on the heights will be overcome by sleep. No hurrahs until we get to the first enemy trench within grenade throwing distance. The mortar company of the battalion from the evening to be located in the same trench where the battalion. As soon as its commander hears shouts of hurrah and grenade explosions, immediately open fire on the western slopes of the heights on the left. On the right will fire mortar battery of the regiment to cut off the way of approach from it reinforcements. To transfer the fire, the commander will personally signal the mortars with red flares. The commander of the regimental artillery battery also at night to roll the guns to the battalion. As soon as his companies seize the heights quickly in hand, two guns, on the right height, two, on the left. Set them on direct fire. The battalion commander to allocate the necessary number of men to assist the artillery men. Let them together with the calculations roll guns and bring to the heights boxes of shells. The commander of the company of machine gunners before and during the attack is with me. With the capture of heights to move the company to the battalion on the left height. Having finished setting the tasks, checked how the commanders understood them. After that, he let them go to prepare the units for the attack. He called the regimental engineer to him and gave him the task to mine the western slopes of the heights as soon as the 2nd Battalion captured them. The rain that had been drizzling all night had stopped by dawn and a thick fog descended on the ground. This was to our advantage. As soon as in the east it was lightly greying, the battalion silently rose from the trench and moved to the heights. In spite of the fact that the Nazis now and then launched rockets into the sky, his companies immediately disappeared into the fog. Ten minutes passed. Fifteen. Complete silence. But here the fog spilled out of itself friendly grenade bursts, the cry of hurrah. Immediately our mortars opened fire. Automatic rifles rang out, machine gun bursts. The artillery men of the regimental battery of junior Lieutenant I. P. Lugovoy, who before this battle replaced Captain D. A. Chavontsev, who was out due to wounding. A. Chavontsev, on their hands, rolled their guns to the heights. They were helped by the gunners. Judging by the sounds, the battle had already moved to the western slopes of the heights. It was urgent to bring forward a company of machine gunners and consolidate the success of the battalion. I arrived on the crest of the heights together with the machine gunners. It had already dawned, the fog had visibly cleared. It became visible as about a kilometre ahead of the 2nd Battalion repulsed the Nazi counterattack. The regiment's mortar battery and the battalion's mine company were of considerable help to it in the atomic attack. Accurate bursts of mines cut several men out of the enemy chain at once. Another volley, another. In Hitler's chain, more and more gaps. But the fascists do not stop, do not lie down. With cries of who, they are trying to overcome the barrage of mortar units to get closer to the battalion. I ran up to the battery of junior Lieutenant Lugovoy. They have just set the guns to direct fire. True, two gunners are still fiddling with the bed of the first gun. One of them slips and falls. Faster, faster, guys! I shout to them and also pick up the left bed. Bot now both guns are ready to open fire. Lugovoy commands. On the infantry, a fragmentation grenade. The first shells of our batteries burst from behind the chain with a flight. The second volley. Now the splash of two bursts rises already among the fascists. Several figures fall. Target! I hear the report of the senior on the battery. Fugitive! sounds the loud voice of the junior lieutenant. The chain of the enemy battalion running into the attack finally trembled and lay down. On the right, on the neighbouring height, there is also a strong fight. Their grenades are bursting, machine gun bursts are frequent. As it turned out, Hitler's infantry managed to break into our trench here and the platoon of the regimental artillery battery did not have time to drag its guns to the height. We need to help the battalion's right flank company and the battery. Senior Lieutenant Kulakov to me, I shouted to the adjutant. 
Senior Lieutenant I. A. Kulikov, Commander of the Company of Machine Gunners. He is not far from me, observing the battlefield. Kulikov, on the right flank of the 4th Company is hard. We must knock the Hitlerites out of the trench. Take your two platoons and try to hit the Nazis in the flank. And grenades? Use more grenades, got it? Understood, Comrade Major. In front of us, the enemy chain is trying to get up every now and then, but after running a few metres, they fall down again. For some reason, the Hitlerites are not firing machine guns. They are trying to throw hand grenades, but they do not reach our fighters. Battalion companies also almost do not fire. I ask the commander why he shoots fascists so weakly. After all, they are almost near. He reports that the weapon is clogged with mud and it fails every now and then. That's what it is, and the Germans' machine guns are probably out of order. That's why they're throwing grenades aimlessly. At Etuasas, I reported the situation to the corps commander. General Kruglikov listened to me and ordered to hold the heights at all costs. I again asked him for permission to remove the 1st Battalion from the right flank and pull it up here, because it was very difficult to hold the heights with one battalion and a company of machine gunners. General Kruglyakov was silent, then said into the tube, I won't give you anything and don't ask me. But you were able to take the heights with the available forces? I could. And in the beginning, too. So hold on, Komulo, hold on. And hung up the phone. Hold on, hold on, I said to myself and grinned unhappily. Senior Lieutenant Kulikov, meanwhile, had already started a trench battle on the right height. There I could hear grenade explosions, shouts of hurrah, and Hitlerites, squeezed from two sides by Kulikov's machine gunners and shooters of the 4th Company, soon could not stand it, began to jump out of the trench to withdraw, shooting back from the height. And the artillerymen at that moment accelerated the advance of their guns to the crest of the height, and soon, having set them on direct aiming, opened a quick fire on the retreating fascists. So, the height is in our hands. But will the enemy accept it? Hardly. Having regrouped his forces, he will again try to regain these favourable positions. And so it came to pass. At eleven odds, up to two of his infantry battalions without tanks, but under the accompaniment of fire of four artillery divisions at once climbed to the heights. Hitlerites again attacked both heights at once. It was seen how their officers with shouts ran behind the chains, waved pistols, pushed soldiers in the backs, kicked. The infantry again did not fire. Clogged with mud, German weapons failed at all. This caused the fascist soldiers additional fear, uncertainty in the success of the attack. Two volleys made our mortar company and fell silent. Batteries of junior Lieutenant Lugovoy also fired only two shots from each gun. There was no ammunition. They were used up when taking the heights and repulsing the first counter-attack. And now, our rifles and automatic rifles rarely fired. The riflemen also kept every cartridge on the books. It remained only to wait for the moment when the enemy chain would approach the trenches to throw a grenade. And it came closer. Immediately, dozens of explosions covered with smoke the Hitlerites who broke forward. They also began to pelt our trenches with grenades, so lasted a few minutes. Then, leaving dozens of corpses on the slopes of heights, the fascists on the left flank and in the centre of the battalion's combat order rolled back. But on the right, a small group of them still managed to break into our trench at the junction of the first company and a company of machine gunners and up to a platoon of infantry, having passed the trench, rushed to the crest of the height where the guns of the regimental battery stood. And then Junior Lieutenant Lugovoy, having turned his calculations in a chain, bravely led them to the enemy. I personally saw how he smashed the head of a Nazi officer who had attacked him with a gun bannock. Having destroyed the Hitlerites who rushed to the guns, the battery men together with shooters and machine gunners began to beat the fascists out of the trench. And they did, but not from all of them. Up to two platoons of the enemy still settled at the junction of the trench and the passage of communication going to the rear of the Germans, having rendered stubborn resistance. 
Several of our attempts to dislodge them from there were unsuccessful. The battle had already lasted several hours, but for how many more hours or even minutes will be enough ammunition in the companies? This thought did not give rest. It was at this moment and ran to me and Adjutant Lieutenant Suslov, joyfully reported, Ammunition brought, Comrade Major. Where? I turned to him. Victor pointed at the soldiers, headed by a petty officer, approaching to the NP in the course of the message. They were carrying ammunition boxes. Petty officer to me! I shouted. He ran up. I recognised him as the commander of the utility platoon from the 2nd Battalion. How much and what kind of ammunition was delivered? There is ammunition, the petty officer started to report. And grenades. Do you have grenades? A little bit. How little? How much? Yes, with a hundred probably, will be, hesitantly answered the platoon commander. Just that? It's a drop in the ocean. But... Tell you what, petty officer, do you see that high-rise over there? I pointed to the right. That's the 4th Company, the Machine Gun Company and the Regiment's Artillery. All the grenades you've got, get them over there. It's urgent. Pass it on. Come here and report to me. Got it? Understood, Comrade Major. Do you need ammunition too? And some ammunition, of course, but every single grenade over there. Yes, one more thing. Did you bring the mines for the mine-sweeping company? That's right. Now they're unloading them at the firing line, shouted the petty officer already running away with his men. A few minutes later I was called to the radio by the chief of staff of the regiment, Major Nikitin. Reported that the corps commander still allowed to remove the 1st Battalion from the right flank and use it by decision of the regiment commander. That is mine. How long does it take for the battalion to arrive here? I asked the chief of staff. Not less than three hours, he replied. Get him here faster and make the chief of armament bring ammunition and more hand grenades for him. Although the first battalion would not be here soon, but it immediately became easier on the soul, the hope that everything would work out with its arrival. The last, third attack was launched by the enemy at dusk. He started it without fire preparation, without noise and illumination of the area. In short, he tried to copy our morning attack on the heights, but it didn't work. We fought back relatively easily this time. The situation has changed only on the right flank, where, as already mentioned, in the daytime there were up to two platoons of enemy infantry. Now, of course, there were more fascists there. Taking advantage of the message passage which led to their rear, they accumulated on the flank until darkness. And with the beginning of the attack from the front, they squeezed the 4th Rifle Company and seized several dozen metres of trench. They installed machine guns there and began to shoot the rear of the battalion. It is necessary to knock out the fascists from there by all means, only if the 1st Battalion would come sooner but it's still not here. And it seems to me that more than three hours have passed since the call of the Chief of Staff. Somewhere around 22 hours to me at the MP finally came to the head of intelligence of the regiment and the commander of one Captain I.P. Rasmotrov, P. Rasmotrov. The battalion commander reported that he had 140 men, including the home platoon. In rifle companies on average 30 soldiers, Ammunition is available, people are fed. Immediately I put Rasmotrov task. Before morning to knock out the Nazis from the trench on the right flank, and trench there and be ready in the morning to repel repeated counter-attacks of the enemy. The 4th Company and two platoons of automatic riflemen to change and withdraw to my reserve. At 23.30 I was called to the phone acting commander, Colonel S. E. Klimakin, he informed me that my 885th Rifle Regiment is again subordinated to the division and that our task remains the same, to restore the position on the right flank and firmly hold the occupied heights. The 878th and 802nd Regiments have suffered heavy losses. Now they are cleaning their rear, leaving the minimum number of personnel in them. The rest are being put into service. 
The division is ordered to go to the defence, as the commander believes that the goal of the offensive is largely achieved. In conclusion, Klemakin recommended, and me tomorrow morning, to replenish the companies at the expense of the rear units of the regiment. I, in turn, asked him to replace by someone our third battalion, which currently holds the village of Kandogi on the left flank of the division. I justified my request by the fact that between the main forces of the regiment and this battalion, there are two other regiments of the division, and this makes it difficult for me to control its units. In addition, I need the 3rd Battalion here for the defence of the dominant heights. Colonel Klimakin promised to look into everything and to report his decision later. Not even an hour after this conversation, as the Chief of Staff of the Regiment radioed that by 3 Zhao Mi and the Division Commander calls Major General Krugliakov. His command post, said Major Nikitin, is in the same German pillbox in which he came to us on the first day of the offensive. The call to the Corps CP, which I knew was six kilometres away, was very unfortunate. After all, the 1st Battalion is preparing to restore the position on the right flank, and I... Something had to be done. Or maybe the commander would give me a new task and it would be better to hold the 1st Battalion for the time being, not to introduce it into the battle. That's what, after thinking, I said to the Chief of Staff, come to me, we need to discuss the situation together. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion has already started a fight on the right flank. We heard heavy machine gun fire, grenadines began to burst, the Germans began to illuminate the area. Soon the shooting spilled over to the entire section of the regiment's defence, then even further. Hitlerites became alarmed. Apparently they thought that our units at night went on the offensive on a wide front. It became light, almost like daytime, from flares continuously soaring into the sky, Tracer bullets lightning pierced the night darkness. Artillery rumbled on both sides, mortars rumbled. Telephonists rang, radio stations started working, requesting the situation down below. Coronel Klimakin allowed me to. What is going on there? he asked, reported that the 1st Battalion fulfills the order to restore the position on the right flank, and the Nazis are scared and opened fire everywhere fearing that our troops will go on the offensive in the entire area of the breakthrough. In this situation I cannot leave here, I said Klimakin, and the time to go to the Corps Commander, so as not to be late. I will report to General Krugliakov, he answered me. In the meantime the firefight was growing and then fading. The 1st Battalion had cleared the trench, but now the Hitlerites were firmly holding the communication passage going to their rear and this passage of communication was like an eyesore for us. It gave the enemy the opportunity to secretly bring their units to our front line and suddenly attack the right flank. It was necessary to knock them out from here as well, and then to block the way with slingshots made of barbed wire and to mine it. The regimental engineer made such slingshots in the afternoon, prepared and anti-personnel mines. And now the sapper platoon was waiting to get down to business. Indeed? When? More than an hour passed and still no call from the division commander. I had to contact him. I cannot get through to the corps commander, said Klimakin. And how are you, situation? The battle is hot, from the trench of the fascists knocked out, but they are firmly entrenched in the course of the message. If they are not smoked out of there now at night during the day, they will use it to prepare their counter-attacks. That's what happened yesterday. I see but you still leave the chief of staff or your deputy in charge and go out yourself. And why does the commander call? I asked Klimakin. I do not know. He did not tell me anything when he called. Take a map just in case, maybe there will be some changes, and come out quickly, or you'll be late. Major Nikitin, chief of staff, was next to me. Here's what, Alexander Artemovich, I told him. The 1st Battalion knocked the Nazis out of the trench, but it's not enough. It is necessary to eliminate them in the course of the message and mine it. Regimental engineer got the task. I'm leaving for Comcorps. You stay for me. Take command. If there are any changes, I'll try to call you. Taking Lieutenant Suslov with me, I went to the commander's office, winding my way through the communications. 
On the way, we got somewhere in a dead end, quite apart from the CP of the Corps Commander. By the time we found him, Colonel Klimakin was there with the staff of the Division's Operational Department. Well, you walk slowly, reproached me, Colonel. It's good that Krugliakov is still resting. General Krugliakov received us at the fourth hour of the night. After listening to Klimakin, and then me, about the situation, said that we received an order from the commander to stop the offensive because its goal has been achieved and moved to the defence. He summoned us in order that both the commander and I, as the commander of the regiment, which had settled such important heights for the Corps, to personally convey the tasks for the upcoming defensive period. And I sent other commanders a written order, said the general. We stayed at Comcor's place for a short time. About an hour later, I was already walking with the adjutant in the opposite direction, thinking about the words of the Corps commander. The goal of the offensive has been achieved. How to understand it? After all, the Corps attacked for more than a week and advanced by only six or eight kilometres. Was such a goal really pursued? I got the answer to this question a little later when the summer and fall campaign of 1943 was over. When, as a result of the victory of our troops in the Battle of Kursk, the offensive was launched on the entire strategic front and especially in the south of our country. And active combat operations by individual corps, which were carried out by our 33rd Army, also had, it turns out, a direct relation to the general offensive. After all, despite the minor successes, these corps bound drew on themselves quite large forces of the Nazi Army Group Center, not allowing the Wehrmacht High Command to move them to the south against our other fronts. So that was the clue to the words of our Comcorps, so the defense, but we did not stay in it for long. On November 30th, our division was ordered to transfer its defensive line to another unit of the 33rd Army and to withdraw to the rear in the area east of Layadi. Here we were given a two-day rest. After that, again a march, now already to the south. So on December 5th, the division again returned to its native 10th Army. This army, after the summer offensive, did not conduct active operations and stood since October in defence. Here in our 290th rifle began to arrive replenishment. We brought up to the full staff and armament, vehicles, horse staff. Being in the second echelon of the army, we were intensively engaged in combat training. On the eve of the new year 1944, we received an order. The division to make a night march and concentrate in the forests 25-30 kilometres northeast of Chausi, Mogilev region. In the Mogilev direction, as well as in the Orsha direction, the enemy had time to create a deeply echeloned defence. Its first line was along the Pronya River. It consisted of two positions, each of which had three trenches with a branched network of communication lines and continuous mine blast barriers in front of the front edge and in depth. The second defensive line, also of two positions, was along the Basia River, 15-20 kilometres from the front edge of the first line. The third, consisting of one position, was created along the western bank of the Resta River. The fourth, not fully completed, was along the Rudea River, and the last one, along the western bank of the Dnieper River, and the city of Mogilev itself from the north and northwest was also girdled by several defensive positions, and to the south the advanced position was moved to the eastern bank of the Dnieper. All attempts of the troops of the 10th Army in early October to break through the first line of enemy defences had no success, and later its compounds did not carry out any active actions, except, of course, individual battles of local importance. In the early days of January returned from the hospital commander Colonel I.G. Gasparian. Colonel Klimakin went back to the 33rd Army, having been appointed to the post of division commander. The 290th Rifle headquarters was headed by Lieutenant Colonel P.K. Kuzmin, who had previously worked for us as head of the operational department. In the second half of January, the division was ordered to go on the offensive from the bridgehead on the river Pronya. What was this bridgehead? Its width was a little more than four and depth, about three kilometres. 
we were given two days to prepare for offensive actions. Defined and the final task, the mastery of the district centre of Chaussy. The 885th Rifle Regiment was to attack in the first echelon, on the left flank of the division. Its immediate task was to break through the first position of the enemy's defence, subsequent to advance to a depth of two positions and provide the necessary conditions for the regiment to enter the Battle of the Second Echelon from the morning of the next day of the offensive. On the right operated 808 Second Rifle Regiment. Artillery preparation was planned to last 23 minutes to the depth of only the first position. The division did not receive any artillery reinforcement. It was this, insufficient artillery support, that prevented it from fully accomplishing its task. After several days of fierce fighting, the 290th Infantry Division was forced to go on the defensive again. February 19th, returned from the hospital, the former commander of the 885th Regiment. You'll have to give up his place, Komolo, said, calling me to himself, the division commander. But don't worry, you won't be left without a post. You will go to the Army Reserve as Deputy Chief of the Command Staff Retraining Courses. No matter how bitter it was to part with the regiment, but what can you do? One must obey the order, and on the second day, having said goodbye to my friends, I left for a new place of service. The head of the course, Colonel A. M. Salnikov, met me with friendliness. We had known him for a long time, since the end of 1942, when he came to our division as a deputy commander. And now we met again. Scoundrels! Gasparian cursed behind my back. They're coming in for the second day, and all on the left flank. At least they've moved away from their pattern. Yes, the picture on the left flank is even worse. There's no sign of snow here at all. A field black with craters and soot densely strewn with corpses. And this height must have changed hands several times. On its eastern slopes there are two burnt tanks behind them, two of our pounded guns. Here the soldiers also sit one or two at a time in the craters and fire. Is the situation clear? asked the division commander when I finished the inspection of the area. Clear, comrade general. Then go to the regiment. A liaison officer will guide you. He has been there several times already. Take command and don't take a step back. Gasparian looked intently into my eyes and once again shook my hand in farewell. This is the second time I have to take over the regiment during the battle. And who has experienced it at least once knows how hard it is to get into the situation from the start, to make a decision without knowing either the enemy or even their own, who are near you at the regiment's base. Not to mention platoon leaders, company leaders, combatants, but there is a word as short as a shot. It is necessary. We reached the regiment's observation post together with the liaison officer, sometimes by running over and sometimes by crawling. At the observation post we found the assistant chief of staff of the regiment, the chief of intelligence, and an artillery captain. To my question, where the deputy commander of the regiment, Pomnak Stabar replied, wounded recently sent to the medical centre. And the chief of staff? He is at the command post. And where is the command post? Pomnakstabar hesitated. Then he answered, On the other side of the river? What combat units are near it? None. They're all here. There's the rear. I was surprised at this state of affairs. So who was in charge of the battle here? After all, Several counterattacks were repulsed, and the commander is the chief of staff? And the chief of staff? All right. For now we need to at least understand the situation. I'm turning to the chief of intelligence. I'm ordering, report on the enemy. Senior Lieutenant Zaganov, he introduces himself, then reports, against us operates at least one and a half regiments, and units in them from different divisions. In front of the right flank of the regiment, for example, and further to the neighbour, battalions from the 323rd Infantry Regiment of the 63rd Division, and from about the middle of our defences, and to the left, to the grove on the heights, the 96th Infantry Regiment of the 46th Division. 
Taken prisoners and documents of killed enemy soldiers confirm these data. This division came up here on the night of February 24th and from the morning of the 25th began to counterattack on a wide front. One of its regiment is found on the right flank of the bridgehead, in front of parts of the 326th Infantry Division. I do not understand how this 46th Division acts, I said to the senior lieutenant. One of its regiments here, the others to the right, and between them, parts of the 63rd Infantry Division. Very simple, comrade major. The Nazis apparently hoped to counterattack from the flanks, along the direction converging in the centre, on the first day to dislodge our division from the Brigaheed. Therefore, eh? and built their combat order so that the main forces of the 46th Infantry attacked at the junction of the two divisions, our and 326th, and one regiment struck here, on the left flank. From the front, the 63rd Infantry Division, which is less effective, was holding back our attack. I see. By the way, the 63rd Infantry is an old acquaintance of ours, I told Zaganov. We beat it back in December and January. Here's what, Scout. I think that Hitlerites will regroup at night to resume counterattacks in the morning, get the tongue, and take him in front of our left flank. Understood, Comrade Major. And who will report on the combat and numerical composition of the regiment? I asked. Allow me, Comrade Major, stood up Assistant Chief of Staff of the regiment, Captain A.K. Mironov. There is no exact data on losses for today. We will have them by 22 hours. But I tentatively believe that in the companies remained no more than 22-23 active bayonets. All three battalions have been operating in the first echelon since yesterday. In the reserve company of machine gunners in the number of 60 men. The battalions are, the first on the right flank, in the centre, the third, it was introduced into the battle yesterday morning, and on the left, the 2nd Battalion. It is the one that has suffered the greatest losses today. On it came almost all the counter-attacks. With this battalion must be dealt with especially, I ordered Mironov, and the faster the better, make a separate decision on it. Understood. Acting Chief of Artillery Regiment Captain A.S. Chudov reported, The regimental artillery battery has only three guns, we use them for firing from closed firing positions. Why? The regiment has almost no divisional artillery, only one cannon division, and in the first echelon there are three battalions. We had to distribute artillery to support them as follows. Artillery division, third battalion, regimental battery, first battalion and the second, mortar battery of the regiment. It's all clear. Here's the thing, Captain. Ammunition for all weapons to carry all night and do not stop, even during the day. By morning, transfer the regimental artillery battery to the left flank and put it on direct aim. Shoot at the enemy infantry on ricochet. But comrade major... Captain Chudov started. No objections, Captain. Do your best to fulfil the order. The battery will be placed behind the combat order of the 2nd Battalion. As for the use of other artillery units... I'll make a decision when we clarify the state of the battalions. That's it. By midnight, the Chief of Staff came to me at the NP. Together with him, we clarified the combat and numerical composition of the regiment. As expected, the 2nd Battalion suffered the greatest losses. He had 25-27 soldiers left in the companies. The command staff, together with the commander, only five people. The 3rd Battalion is the most combat-ready, it has up to 40 or more bayonets in companies. It turned out that on the left flank, where we had to wait for the morning attacks, was the most exsanguinated battalion. The decision was self-evident, to narrow the frontal defence of the second battalion. The first and third battalions were left with their mortar companies, regimental mortar and artillery batteries to strengthen the second battalion. Artillery division left in its subordination, after the given orders to all battalions were sent employees of the regimental headquarters to assist commanders and control the timely execution of decisions. The day began with a powerful enemy artillery preparation on the entire battle order of the regiment, 
as well as on the neighbour to the right, the 885th Infantry Regiment. And following the rampart of fire, Nazi machine gunners rushed into the attack. On the 3rd and 2nd battalions went up to a regiment of infantry, but without tanks. At the junction with the neighbour on the right there was only up to a battalion. Hitlerites, as it was supposed, concentrated their main efforts on our left flank, the 2nd battalion, and there immediately created a critical situation. The thing is that from one of the flanks of the 2nd battalion and up to the river Pronya, there was a kind of corridor, two and a half, three kilometres wide. It was not covered by rifle units. True, the corridor was mined, it was blocked by forest debris. But for how long could these obstacles delay the Nazis? For a few minutes, no more. And then? No, it is urgent to put forward some unit to close the corridor, to secure the left flank of the battalion. But where would I find that unit? I've only got a company of machine gunners left in my reserve. The last reserve. But what can we do? We have to throw it into the fight. There's no other way out. While I called its commander, set him a task, a group of fascist infantry, not meeting resistance in the corridor, began to move quickly along the west bank of the river Pronia, threatening the rear of the regiment. I called Chudov, who was watching the same group through binoculars. What are we going to do, Captain? Our machine gunners are unlikely to get there in time. Maybe we'll cover the Hitlerites with mortars. Mortars in battalions reflect the enemy from the front. They can't be redirected answered Chudov. But I have another combined group of thirteen mortars. Permission to open fire? A combined group of thirteen mortars? It's such a gift that... Well done, Captain. But where did these mortars come from? There's no time to ask. I'll find out later, after the battle, how we got them. Chudov himself will tell that yesterday, being at the firing positions of his mortars on the eastern bank of the river, he met eight mortar detachments that had broken away from their units, and until the location of the necessary regiments decided to keep these calculations at his place, temporarily including them in the battery of 120mm mortars of our regiment. But this, I repeat, Captain Chudov will tell after the battle. In the meantime, I, madly delighted by the presence of this combined group, ordered to open fire on the fascists who broke through the corridor. Chudov quickly contacted her by telephone, gives the appropriate command. And now I see first single, and then a whole series of bursts in the fighting order of the enemy infantry coming to our rear. It begins to suffer losses, slows down the pace of advance. Well, more fire, and Chudov understands me without words. He makes the necessary adjustments for the mortars and commands. Fugitives, fire! I do not take my binoculars from my eyes. In front of the enemy chain lies more than a dozen ruptures, then another and another. Hitlerites can't stand it any longer, they start to turn back. But it's too late. Our automatic riflemen are running in front of them, firing on the move. In a few minutes, the corridor is already blocked. The group of fascists that broke through is cut off from their main forces. By 12 o'clock, the group was finished. The commander of the company of machine gunners reports, over 40 Hitlerites killed, 11 captured. Our losses are minimal. Only now I find time to ask where we got a combined Ming group. And when I find out, I frown. I'm ordering Captain Chudov. Immediately send someone else's mortar crews to their units. They're probably looking for them there. Let them not lose them, tries to justify himself. It's the fault of those who got lost. They'll be charged. And you. I hope it won't happen again, right? Good. Yes, one more thing. Give these mortars some kind of document, a receipt that they fought with us, or they'll be put on trial in their regiments. By the way, since that memorable day, the fascists did not bother us any more. We did not take active actions either. So it went on until March 3rd, and on the night of the 4th, having transferred the defence of the bridgehead to parts of the 326th Division, our 290th rifle was withdrawn to the second echelon of the army for rest and replenishment. In 1944, the Red Army was tasked to completely cleanse the Soviet land from the Nazi invaders and then help the peoples of Eastern Europe to free themselves from Hitler's slavery. 
the general staff developed the Operation Bagration. The main blow Stavka of the Supreme Command planned to strike in the western direction, the shortest way to the borders of Hitler's Germany. The encompassing position of our troops in Belarusia in relation to the German fascist army group's centre contributed to the success of this offensive operation. By this time, three Belarusian fronts were created. The previously existing Belarusian front was renamed the First. On the basis of the headquarters of the 10th Army, the headquarters of the Second was formed, and the Western Front was renamed the Third Belarusian Front. Our 290th Infantry Division became part of the 70th Infantry Corps, commanded by Major General V. G. Terentiev. As already mentioned in the previous chapter, during March the division units were restaffed with personnel and weapons. And from the first days of April began scheduled combat training. With each company and battalion was held several tactical and formation classes and tactical exercises, including live firing. In June, the regiments began combat training, which ended with regimental exercises with live firing of artillery, tanks and small arms. Our regiment was staffed with good battalion and company commanders. Thus, our combatants were Capt. P. Kierney, M. I. Piatirikov and Y. M. Dvuzilny. I cannot help but remember with a kind word such commanders as L. K. Mironov, M. M. Zagainov, I. M. Terentiuk, M. I. Korsunsky, P. S. Grishchenko, A. S. Mayakin, A. B. Goldberg. Basically, the command staff of the regiment was already hardened in previous battles, and only a small part of the platoon commanders arrived to us recently, after graduating from junior lieutenant courses. But many of them, as it turned out during conversations, before entering these courses also had time to fight in the positions of squad leaders and pomcoms of Zodov. In short, smelled the gunpowder. Yes, the personnel of the regiment was preparing for the upcoming battles hard and persistently. After all, everyone perfectly understood that you can beat the enemy only when you perfectly master the science of victory. And they studied and studied. The sappers, for example, worked tirelessly on their own equipped engineering camp, again and again practicing techniques in making passages in minefields and wire barriers of the enemy, installing explosives, rubble. Battalion and regimental artillery, men practiced reconnaissance of targets and hitting them with direct fire. Rifle companies practiced in the field, deployed and rolled up, moved through passages in mine and wire barriers, friendly attacked the conditional enemy, learning to fire with automatic rifles and handheld machine guns on the move. The radio operators were practicing to quickly get into communication and to switch to new waves. And all this training was completed, as mentioned above, battalion and regimental tactical exercises with live firing. Regimental exercises, held from June 1st to June 10th, were one-sided. Each of them lasted three days. The target situation was created at a depth of up to three kilometres. For the period of the exercises, the regiment was attached to two artillery divisions, for which the target situation was also created. The regiment fired one rifle battalion, the attached artillery, the battalion's minesweepers and the regiment's mortar battery. The artillery fired direct fire. For the exercise was selected a piece of terrain in the rear at a distance of 18 to 20 kilometres from the front line. By its nature, the terrain was similar to that where the enemy defences. Here flowed a river, though not as wide as the Pronia, but it allowed to work out the issues of forcing. Command and staff exercises were also held, which were personally led by the commander Major General Thor G. Gasparian. In the morning of June 14th, regiment commanders were invited to the commander to receive a combat task. The whole day General Gasparian worked with us and the heads of the branches of troops and services, with our assistance. The decision to break through the enemy defences was announced by the division commander in the middle of the day. The terrain on which to act coincided with the one where our classes on commander's training were held. Only the right border of my regiment, the same as the division, included in the offensive zone square grove at a distance of one and a half kilometres from the front edge of the enemy defences. 
There were no immediate neighbours on the right. On the left was advancing 885th Rifle Regiment, supported by a company of tanks. To reinforce our regiment received Artillery Brigade Breakthrough RGK, without one division and the 1st Division of the Artillery Regiment of the Division. The Artillery Brigade was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel B. K. Wojcikowski. He was a competent and quite experienced artilleryman who had already participated with his brigade in the breakthrough of enemy defences. We were allocated and two sapper companies, whose task was to make passages in the barriers, the passage of troops through them and the subsequent accompaniment of infantry and artillery in the offensive. One last thing. For the period of artillery preparation, the regiment was assigned a battery of self-propelled artillery units to destroy bunkers on the front line of enemy defences. It consisted of five SAU-152. On the morning of June 15th, the division commander scheduled a reconnaissance of the area and warned that it would be attended by the army commander, Lieutenant General C.A.T. Grishin and the corps commander Major General V.G. Terentiev. Since the commander planned to start work at 10 Sierrast from the site of our regiment, I and my officers should have conducted reconnaissance even earlier from dawn to have time to get data on the enemy in the breakthrough area from the headquarters of the part that stood here in defence. Yes, and personally to study the terrain, the outline of the front edge, to determine the strongholds in the enemy's defence, the approaches to the river and places of access to its opposite bank. It's good that in the second half of June is the shortest night and the longest day. Otherwise, we would not have time until ten Torsigard. After all, we need at least six to eight hours of light time to solve all the mentioned issues. When we approached the edge of the forest, southwest of the village of Ryazna, we were stopped by the Commandant's patrol. An officer came up to me, introduced himself and said, it is forbidden to go further on horseback. I ask you, Comrade Lieutenant Colonel, to dismount, take the horses deep into the forest, and follow the route of the message. I'll point it out to you. This was one of the measures of the Army Headquarters, which strictly monitored the observance of all its instructions on camouflage and secrecy of preparation for the offensive. The Chief of Reconnaissance of the Defending Regiment gave us detailed information about the enemy showed us a reconnaissance scheme of his strongholds and targets in them, and the regimental engineer provided a scheme of engineering equipment of the terrain and obstacles in front of the leading edge of their own and enemy defences. All this made it much easier for us to conduct reconnaissance. By ten o'clock in the morning, the decision to attack the regiment with the appropriate calculations and calculations for its justification was basically ready. Now we could meet the high command and report to him. Exactly at ten o a dapper and trim captain came out from behind the bend of the trench with a quick step. Behind him appeared a group of military men, on their somewhat bulky figures, a simple red army uniform. This is also an element of camouflage. In front went Commander Lieutenant General I.T. Grishin. Next, the commander of the 70th Rifle Corps, Major General V.G. Terentiev. Then, our commander and five senior officers. After greeting us, the commander took binoculars and began to examine the terrain in front of the enemy defence, at the same time listened to the explanations of the Chief of Intelligence Corps. On the order of Artillery Preparation Commander reported to the commander of the Artillery Division Commander, Colonel A.I. Zorkin. It, as I heard, will last 90 minutes and consist of four firing raids and one false transfer of fire. The commander, having listened to Colonel Zorkin, turned to the commander, asked, What regiment is advancing here? The 878th Rifle Regiment, Gasparian answered him. Are you ready to report the decision? The commander turned to me. Ready, comrade commander. I answered and began my report with the characterization of the enemy. Let's not waste time, IT. Grishin stopped me softly. I was already listening to the Chief of Intelligence. If you have something to add or something he missed, then of course report. And so? The calm tone of the commander disposed to him, removed the stiffness. It was easy to report, especially since I.T. Grishin listened attentively without interrupting. 
and after listening to my decision and the sequence of its implementation, even praised me. I asked the commander and the commander-in-chief if they had any questions for me. They replied that they had no questions. Do you have any questions for me? asked me commander. I have a request, comrade commander. I ask you to reliably suppress the enemy in that grove over there. And I told him my fears for the enemy. Lieutenant General looked first at the map, then raised binoculars to his eyes, pointed them at the grove and looked at it for a long time. Yes, indeed, these pine trees can hide trouble under their crowns, he said in a low voice. Hadn't we better go around it? Over there, on the left? Turning to all those standing, asked the commander. I insisted. We should clear the grove of the enemy at once, not leave it for later. Then it might be too late. Well, well. What do we have in reserve? Grishin turned to one of the colonels accompanying him. Aviation all involved, comrade commander, he replied. Only two regimental volleys of rocket artillery remain. Good, said the commander. Comrade Terentiev, plan one regimental salvo of rocket artillery on the grove at the end of the artillery preparation. Turning to me, he added, that's all I can help you with. You can decide what you want to do next. Thank you for that, comrade commander, but I have... What else? One last request. Plan a firing rampart in front of my left flank battalion to the same depth as in front of the neighbouring regiment. This will help it to seize the crest of those heights in a short time. Then, by introducing the second echelon to bypass the grove from the west, I will easily cut off all escape routes for the enemy defending in it. Well, that's a good idea, Lieutenant Colonel. And what will the God of War say to us on this? The commander looked at Colonel Zorkin. Ammunition is not enough, comrade commander, he replied. Is there enough artillery? How many barrels do you have per kilometre of the breakthrough front? In the direction of the main blow, 160, comrade commander, and here, 120. Still, think over the regiment commander's request. As for ammunition, you will still bring them, I will order, said Grishin, and already to the division commander. Count it all together and report to me. That was the end of the work on the ground. The next day I worked until late afternoon again with battalion commanders on the ground. Here we determined each company's starting point of the attack, its direction, places of assembly of rafts and the order of forcing the river. With the battery commanders clarified the targets, the sequence of their defeat both during the general fire training and during the attack, the locations of observation posts, areas of firing positions. We returned to the regiment's location at about midnight. Did not have time to shake off the dust and wash up, as the chief of staff of the division called and warned that tomorrow at ten hour I and the deputy chief of staff to be at the meeting, asked him what it was necessary to have with me. Only a map, replied the Chief of Staff, and hung up the phone. A lot of people gathered for the meeting, in a large tent where we went in with Major G.T. Petushkov. On the wall, from the ceiling to the floor, hung a huge map. It mapped the enemy's defence, the operational structure of the army, tasks to corps, divisions and regiments. At the map crowded commanders of units and formations, checking their tasks with it and clarifying other issues. I found the number of my regiment at the top sixth. It turns out that to the right of us, at a distance of ten kilometres, in a separate direction, broke through the enemy's defence another cause of the army. At ten to Aceres, when everyone was already sitting in their seats, the commander of the Second Belarusian Front, Colonel General G. F. Zakharov, a member of the Military Council of the Front, Lieutenant General L. Z. Meklis, Chief of Staff of the Front, Lieutenant General N. N. Bogolyubov, our commander, entered the tent. After the report, the front commander greeted the audience, then said that he wanted to listen to the regimental commanders about the readiness of their units for the offensive, decisions on the offensive, knowledge of the opposing enemy, reports on the provision of everything necessary to fulfil combat tasks. From each division will be heard one regimental commander. From our 290th rifle, this lot fell on me.
The front commander listened to the reports silently, without interrupting. But a member of the military council of the front, Lieutenant General L. Z. Melis, now and then asked leading questions. And such a sharp tone that the regimental commanders were lost, began to get confused. It was my turn to go to the map. Taking into account the remarks made by Mechlis to the speakers before me, I had already figured out in my mind a more or less consistent presentation of the necessary material, justifications for the disputed places. I began the report in the same order as at the reconnaissance. General G. F. Zakharov listened attentively and all the time followed the pointer, which I operated on the hanging map. When I said that the report is over, he looked at L. Z. Mechlis and said, I have no questions for the regiment commander. And you? I have, Melis replied sharply, and turning to me asked, Tell me, when does the fog descend from Pronya? I reported that yesterday, for example, there was no fog. In the previous days, there was only once in the morning, but it was insignificant. And today it was, or not I can't report, because I left for the meeting after dark. You were on your way to the military council of the front, so you must know everything you'll be asked here. When will you start artillery training? How can you answer this question if you do not know when the fog comes off the river? Maley stood up, began to walk back and forth along the table, gesticulating. Such a fog as there was three days ago. The beginning of artillery preparations will not interfere, comrade member of the military council, I answered with some passion. On the contrary, if it lies in the morning on the day of the offensive, it will not hinder but help us. Mechlis came close to me, fixed his glare on me, then said with a grin, Well, 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 so to contribute, do you hear? He made a sweeping gesture with his hand and addressed the crowd. He says that the fog will even favour him. When was it that the fog contributed to the artillery preparation? Again, he turned to me. The regiment, before attacking the enemy's defences, still has to ford the river, comrade member of the military council. I stood my ground. And for that we need to assemble rafts on which we will ford the river. That's where the fog will help us. As for the artillery preparation, even here it is not a hindrance. After all, the first trench of the enemy is only 200, 250 metres from the water's edge. The banks are steep and the fog does not cover it. Well, that makes sense. And why do you have such uniforms? Suddenly abruptly changed the subject of conversation Mehlis, feeling with his fingers the sleeve of my cotton overalls. They issue such uniforms, comrade member of the military council. It can't be. Regimental commanders and cotton, Melis said with surprise, looking for someone among those sitting with his eyes. But not finding the one he was looking for, he turned to the audience. Why do you, regimental commanders, all receive such uniforms? All of them, was heard in the tent. Come on, regimental commanders, stand up, Mechlis commanded. Those stood up. A member of the military council of the front went first to one, then to another, then to a third and, convinced of the correctness of the answer, returned to the table. Good. All regimental commanders before the offensive sew good uniforms. Army commander, the head of the rear of the front tomorrow to send tailors to the units and take the measure from the regimental commanders. And for you? He turned to me. I'll send my tailor. Thank you, comrade member of the military council, for your concern, I replied. Voices of approval were heard in the tent, but they were caused, I think, not so much by the decision of the member of the military council as by the change of the subject of conversation in general. After all, before that, frankly speaking, there was some oppressive atmosphere in the tent. By the way, L. Zied Mechlis was soon recalled by the Stavka to Moscow, and instead of him, Lieutenant General N. E. Subotin, a fine soul, an excellent educator and a senior comrade, with whom I was to meet later, far beyond the borders of Belarus, became a member of the Military Council of the Second Belarusian Front. 
A few days after the military council of the front, we had a party meeting in our regiment. I was assigned to report on the tasks of the communists of the unit in the upcoming offensive, on the role of party organisations in mobilising the personnel for the qualitative performance of the combat task. The party meeting was held with great excitement. It was addressed by 16 people. Among them were the commanders of battalions and companies and deputies on political part and just fighters communists. All excitedly talked about the sacred duty of every member and candidate for membership in the All-Union Communist Party to be always a heed in the line of fire, by personal example to inspire the soldiers of the regiment to exploits for the liberation of the motherland from the Nazi invaders. Then there were battalion meetings of the personnel, reports on them made by senior officers of the regiment. Many fighters and junior commanders spoke at the meetings. From all the speeches it was clear that the mood of the personnel fighting, and it was pleasing. On the night of June 23rd, the regiment took the initial position to go on the offensive. Representatives of the headquarters and management of the regiment went to the units to assist commanders in organising the battle. We and the commander of the Breakthrough Brigade, Lieutenant Colonel B. K. Wojciechowski, after the battalions went to their own directions, took the observation point, prepared by the regimental sappers in the first trench of the previously defended here part. Once again, we clarified the targets identified by our scouts, discussed the order and time of their suppression. But most of all, of course, I was concerned about the innovation that our command planned to use when attacking the front edge of the enemy's defence, the movement of rifle units directly behind the artillery firing rampart. It cannot be said that I had not heard anything about it before. I had heard it and knew it, but theoretically. And now my battalions have to do it practically. How can I not worry? Every now and then I turned to Wojciechowski with the same question. Would his artillery men mess something up? Would they not hit their own? But he assured me that everything would be all right. After all, not for the first time, not once had to implement this method of firing and in other directions. Talking by radio and even by telephone in order to keep secret, our preparation for the offensive is strictly forbidden. I hear everything only orally. The commanders send me liaisons with reports on the occupation of the initial boundaries and readiness to go on the attack. The division commander about the readiness of the regiment reported the conditional signal. And finally, by telephone. But, call signs before the start of artillery preparation, we took those that were still used by the commanders of the defending troops here. The division commander, for example, the call sign of the commander of the defending regiment, and we, regimental commanders, received the call signs of his combatants. Even if someone overhears us, he will conclude that everything is the same on this site. There are no new troops. The night before the offensive in the regiment, no one could not sleep. Everyone was looking forward to the next morning. The first offensive operation Bagration began pilots. From the onset of darkness and until dawn, high in the sky, the hum of the engines of hundreds of bombers. They were coming from east to west, and the deafening bursts of bombs dropped by them deep in the rear of the enemy shook the ground. Bombardment was subjected and railroad junctions, warehouses with weapons and ammunition, operational reserves of the enemy in the areas of their concentration and rear defensive lines. The raids were also made on the Hitlerite-built crossings across the Dnieper and Basia rivers, as well as on the headquarters of operational associations. Our light night bombers Po-2 were shuttling tactical defences. We could hear the sound of their engines whirring as they approached the targets, then sharply intensified after dropping bombs. These were brave pilots of the Women's Aviation Regiment. The short night of June was quickly coming to an end, and with the dawn on the entire line of enemy defences came silence. Machine gun bursts were silenced, methodical artillery bombardment of the area by squares and our rear stopped. Do Hitlerites really do not guess about anything? There is a small haze over the Pronia floodplain. It's not a fog, but still. Under its cover, in an hour and a half, battalions of the first echelon will start to force the water barrier 
and accumulate for attack on the opposite bank. At 6E, they synchronised their watches according to Moscow time, before the beginning of artillery preparation was still 37 minutes, and the attack is scheduled for 9Z. I was notified of this in writing by the division commander, and not in advance, but only two hours ago at Fort Year. I informed the battalion commanders of the time C, through representatives of the regimental headquarters at 5 CEO. Five minutes before the start of the artillery preparation, Lieutenant Colonel Wojciechowski also got in touch with his divisions for the first time and ordered, charge and report. In turn, I called the combatants, in turn to the phone, once again asked them about their readiness, reminded them about the beginning of the advance to the river, at the same time as the first bursts of shells in the enemy's defence zone. He said that the artillery preparation would begin and end with a salvo of Katyusha's. This is a signal to the artillerymen about the end of the general artillery preparation and the transition directly to the support of rifle units and to us to start the attack. The commanders reported, understood. At first, as it was planned, fire comets hissed over us, and then the air shook salvos of hundreds of barrel artillery guns. Enemy defences were immediately enveloped in clouds of smoke and dust. There everything is rumbling, boiling in fire. I see our battalions launch rafts and ferries. Mortar men are running to the river, carrying barrels and plates on their shoulders. Artillery crews are rolling guns. Liaison officers in groups of two or three people rushing from the NP to their battalions, unwinding the wire. Only 30 minutes of artillery preparation have passed, and the battalions of the first echelon are already finishing the forcing of the Pronia River. On the other bank are all the rifle companies, part of the anti-tank platoons of the battalion artillery and mortar companies. Well, about 10 minutes more and... I see through binoculars as the 3rd Battalion of Captain Divujilny went forward, following the firing rampart. Wojciechowski's divisions were firing jewel-like, putting shells literally 300 to 350 metres ahead of the battalions. Under the cover of this rampart, our chains have already approached the first enemy trench, pelt it with grenades, and not staying here long, with shouts of hurrah, hurry to the second, and here is the third trench of the Hitlerites, the 3rd Battalion is attacking it, and in front of it is that unfortunate grove, on which the regimental salvo of Katyushas is planned. But what is Devujilny? Why does not stop the companies? Is he carried away by the battle, or...? I'm trying to contact him by radio. No answer. Wounded? Killed? What should I do? Report to the division commander, and ask him to stop the Katyusha strikes on the grove. Will I be able to do that? No. I have to stop the battalion myself. Good thing there's already a pontoon bridge across the Pronya River. The car! Hurry up! The car! I shout to the adjutant. And, already, to the chief of staff. Major Gladke, you stay here. Manage the first battalion. I'm going to the third. In a few minutes we are already on the other bank. The driver is squeezing out of the engine of the Willis everything he is capable of. But the funnels, trenches, message lines are in the way. The second battalion in a few minutes will hit the enemy from the rear. Can you support him with fire? I asked him. I can, Balavas answered confidently. Now I will contact Lieutenant Colonel Wojciechowski and adjust the fire of one or two divisions. Then act, but quickly. Right flank company of the fascists defectively accumulate 400 metres from us. The tanks have stopped, supporting the left flank company with fire. And in the village itself the sounds of battle are increasing. Machine guns are firing, our machine guns are beating out a frequent shot, hand grenades are bursting. It turns out that Suzlovsky garrison is also trying to counter-attack the 3rd Battalion from the front. Faster, faster, Balavas! I shout to the artillery division commander. Let's fire! Yes, I will, the captain replies and something transmits to distant from us firing positions. Ahead, behind the Hitlerites' battle lines, several shells exploded. A flight, Balavas again transmits some figures on the radio. 
The second salvo covers the right flank company. Now we have to hit the left flank company. So, don't you like it? The Nazis did indeed scatter between the bursts. A large group of them rushed towards the grove, but here they were met by the men of Captain Pyotirikov's battalion. Look, Balavas, the second battalion is attacking, I shouted to the artilleryman. Stop firing. Now Pyotirikov will deal with them himself. Yes, now the Hitlerites were in trouble. The thing is that at that time from somewhere on the left appeared our 30 checkers, attached to the 885th Rifle Regiment. And on the right, also almost from the grove, with a loud hurrah, the companies of the 1st Battalion of Captain Herney moved rapidly. Very good. All three battalions of the regiment converged at the village of Suslovka.